The first chain that we wear is this chain of being an owner and not a steward. And to get out of it, we need to unshackle this understanding of what ownership looks like. I want to share just a briefly a little bit from my personal story, if that's okay, a little bit about my personal journey, because I came at this not from a position of great success. I came at this from a place of brokenness. And I think, doesn't God speak to us through brokenness a lot? Well, my own brokenness was through a series of leadership roles that I played. And I, you know, I think if the world looked at what I did, they would say he was pretty successful. We ran the seminary for a number of years. I ran a consulting firm. I've run an association, been in leadership position for a long time. And from the outside, it can look pretty successful. People can look at your ministry, your church, and say, oh, church is growing, pastor's preaching, people seem happy, they're successful. But in my spirit, I was broken. I was broken. And I asked myself, why, why is leadership not the abundant life that I would like it to be? Why is it so challenging? And these were some reflection I, I had. And as I go through these, I would ask you if, if any of these might, uh, per, might uh, pertain to you as well. See if you can relate to any of these ideas. The first one was a loss of intimacy with God. A strange thing in doing over being. And I can put it like this. I was so busy doing things for Jesus that I ran out of time to be with Jesus. Do you hear that? I was so busy doing the work of the kingdom that I had no time to be with the king. Busy. Is your ministry life busy? Are you swamped? Can you fill every day with 10, 11 hours of things to do? And if not, can people help you fill your days with 10 or 11, 12 hours of things to do? So often as leaders, in the midst of that, what gets sacrificed is the quiet, intimate, meditative time that we spend in Scripture and in prayer, building intimacy with God. I, I faced that. I faced that. I was successful outwardly, but I lost and missed my intimacy with God. I was measuring results in what I did and not who I was becoming. Oh my goodness, we could spend a lot of time on that, but we won't. Um, people measuring me on outcomes, on what you're producing, and not measuring the quality of the person that you were becoming in Christ. I uh, was um, driven by these expectations of worldly metrics. The world telling us what success looks like. Success looks like more students in a seminary, doesn't it? like a better budget, like a balanced budget, like happy faculty, all these outcomes, where do we measure the spiritual vitality of the people that are here, the, the growth that God would have us to go through, which sometimes might even work against the things that bring more students and more money. Great challenge to us. So the second thing was a shift in self-identity from role to title. And I'm going to talk a lot about this um, with a class tomorrow. In fact, this is one of our main ones tomorrow. But as, as a pastor, I mean, let me ask you, how many of you here have a, some kind of a title by your name? Doctor, pastor, president, some kind of title. You all have, don't, everybody has titles? Some of us have mother, father titles. The temptation we have here is that we shift our identity from the person we are in Christ to the title and the role that we hold in this world. And when we do that, the enemy has us on a very slippery slope. It happens that we get our affirmation for our work through our identity instead of getting our affirmation solely from Christ himself. We become more susceptible to criticism and desirous of applause. I could never figure out why sometimes I was so sensitive to criticism until I realized that they weren't just criticizing my position, they were criticizing me because I had tied my identity to my job. We don't do that if our identity is in Christ. It's one of the slippery slopes that we go down. And decisions, therefore, get tainted with this idea of self-image preservation. We begin to make decisions saying, what decision do I make that makes me look the best instead of what's best for the God's people? 
That hurt a little bit, anybody out there? Can I go, ouch? And an ouch factor there? Yeah, pretty easy to do, isn't it? The third area was people became more means to organizational ends. And with a lot, again, we'll talk more about this. I'm just going to give you a quick overview. But we become so focused on outcomes and accomplishments that people become valued for what they can produce. So the people that work for me needed to be successful so that the organization could be successful so that I could be successful. And so they, their success was tied to my success, which was tied to my identity, and it all gets out of whack when that happens. We reflect this doing bias of my worldview and the need for outcomes of my self-image. Have you ever worked for somebody who is driven, and they, because they're so driven to accomplish, they expect everybody around them to be driven? Right? Terrible, isn't it? Uh, they reflect what's going on out there. I actually, real quick story here. I was mentoring a president of a major U.S university in his transition out of office. He was getting ready to go. And as we were reflecting back, he was, he was getting very candid and very honest with me. And he said, you know, Scott, one thing that I've always struggled with, when one of my key employees would come in and tell me that they were going to take their vacation, which he said, they need to. Everybody needs to take their vacation. It's important for them to take their vacation. Even when they told me they were going to take two weeks or whatever in their time off, in my spirit, I resented it. I resented it because, you ready for this? I don't take vacation. And I'll be here working while they're on vacation. Even though he knew it was important in his spirit, he was so driven that he couldn't affirm his people. He wanted them to be as driven as he was. Now, fortunately, he was able to lead beyond that and get over that, but he knew it in his spirit. That's what happens to us. If, if, if we have this attitude. We can seek to form people into these productive workers, images of our own work. And finally, the fourth area that I struggled with was how much the issue of money dominated everything we did. And I could have used a couple of an amens there, if you're really honest. I know there's some people out there going, yeah, amen, amen. It's always about the budget, isn't it? How, many, how much time do we spend in our leadership position thinking about, praying about, worrying about, strategizing over, planning things that have to do with money and budget. It's amazing, isn't it? Maybe some of you have all the money that you need and it's just not an issue. But for the rest of us, it's a big issue. Um, we struggle with this faith and responsibility tension. I talk more about that, but you've all been at that point where you say, where some people say, if we just had more faith, we should put a budget together based on faith. And others say, no, no, we should be responsible for our budget. Well, who's right? You know, should we step out in faith and trust God and not care about numbers or tell the accountants to go away? Or should we listen to the accountants and plan something very reasonable and sensible but doesn't require faith? Constantly in that tension. Anybody relate to that? There you go. Thank you. I got some faces out there. Um, we had a scarcity mentality. Uh, and this is a huge issue. We're not going to have time. I'm gonna, if you come back on Saturday for the CSA conference, we're going to talk about a scarcity mentality. Scarcity mentality, a huge cancer in our organizations when, when we see everything as not having enough and constantly believing no matter how much money we raised, how many students we had, we never had enough. Do you get caught up in that? We don't have enough time. We don't have enough talent. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough volunteers. We don't have enough facilities or resources. We don't have enough money. And on and on and on, we live this, our ministry and this idea of not having enough. And worried about it, we felt handcuffed by it, and even from time to time, just got angry about it. Money can dominate what we do as leaders. And that was part of my journey, part of my frustration. So it was out of some of these learnings that I began to think about what would it mean to lead in a different way. So it came to this, um, this idea of the extraordinary journey of the faithful steward. And I love the picture of this young lady or guy or whoever it is. Um, pretty big next step that they have, isn't it? But looking off into the, what can be in the future, what kind of journey is God calling us toward? And we're going to begin by talking about what it means, first of all, to be a faithful steward. This is the theology, these two pieces of this theology I want to share with you. And this is my definition, is that a faithful steward is a follower of Jesus Christ who has been set free to live as a one kingdom person in every area of life. A faithful steward is a follower of Jesus Christ 
who's been set free to live as a one kingdom person in every area of life. And my prayer is that by noon, you'll know what all that means. So that's our journey together. First, the first of the two major theological pieces um, are gonna be based on five questions. And I know I'm speaking at a seminary and some of you are gonna look at these questions and going, really? This is what we're gonna talk about? First question is, who is God? And who are we? I know that everybody here this morning got up and said, I hope somebody today can tell me who God is. Well, you're at the right place. We're gonna talk about who is God and who are we? Why were we created? What did Christ do for us? How are we then to live? And a very curious question, where are we to live? Five questions that we're gonna walk through that form the first piece, the seminal piece of theology that undergirds everything that we believe. So let's begin. The first of all is who is God? And I use this picture because we all know that that's what God looks like, right? So I just wanted to make sure that we all understood that that's exactly what God looks like. Um, the heart of God has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Now that's, I think, quite a statement. I believe that might just be the core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, isn't it? Think about that for a minute. The heart of God has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. That's worth an amen, isn't it? Amen. And that is a powerful statement. What that means is that God's nature and his purpose are self-revealed truths. We don't have to go around wondering what God is like, who God is, what does God want, what's, what does God want with me? He came to tell us, didn't he? He came in the person of Jesus Christ. He came in the incarnation to reveal to us the heart of the Father. It's the whole book of John, where over and over again, Jesus says, I came to reveal to you the Father. You want to know what God looks like? Here I am. You want to know what God thinks? Here I am. Listen to me. You want to know what he wants from you? Listen to me. I came to show you the heart of the Father. Oh, my friends, I hope you have great peace in your life, knowing that because you know Jesus, you know the heart of the Father. Isn't that great? There's a world out there trying to figure out who God is, what God is, and what to do with God. And we know, we know, because he, re he revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. There's a whole sermon there. Can I just preach for about an hour on that? That is such a great truth. I hope you're preaching that in your churches. It's a, it's a wonderful truth. Well, what does this mean? This means, therefore, I think three things, real briefly. First of all, um, we know that our God is a triune God. Jesus came to reveal the Father in the name of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, God is relational in his very nature. Isn't that right? We all learn that in our theology classes, that because our God is a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he is relation in his very being. Important for us to know. Second, God is faithful. God is faithful. He is worthy of our trust. If we, don't, we see that in Jesus Christ all over the place, that God is faithful to be trusted. And finally, that God is full of grace and truth. The God of the universe is for us. It's for us. Isn't that great news? Man, I should be jumping them down, putting our hands in the air. But that's right, not a Pentecostal service. We'll do that another time. But it, it really is. It's the good news that God is for us. That's what we know in Jesus Christ. That's what we know with certainty, with absolute certainty. There's no question in our minds who our God is because of what Jesus Christ came to do for us. That's the first piece of this important theology. Secondly, we know who we are. What does this mean? Well, we are image bearers of this God. You see, the beautiful thing about knowing who God is in Jesus Christ is that we're told that we bear the image of God. Do we not? We are all image bearers of God. Well, how foolish would it be if we were told that we were to bear the image of a God that we cannot know? That'd be crazy. How can you bear the image of a God you cannot know? So Jesus reveals us to the heart of God, and he said, now, go into this world and bear the image of a God who is relational, who is trustworthy, who is faithful. That's the, that's the message that we take to the world. So we bear this image, which means we were created for relationship. We were created to be together, in, and we're going to talk about all kinds of different relationships. We were created to trust. God created us to be in a position where, and listen to this very carefully, if we are to live the abundant life that God wants us to live, it will require us at every point to be people 
who trust. Who trust. Has God ever called you to do anything for him that didn't require you to trust in him? I would say, no. That's, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It is a walk of faith, a walk of trust. We are created to be people who trust day by day for everything from God. And finally, created to serve. He called us, created us, that we might serve our neighbor. It's the great commission and the great commandment. So we know who God is in Jesus Christ, and because we know who God is now, we know our, our purpose in life, why we're here. And the third thing, then, is why were we created? Well, if we're to be image bearers of God, in, we're to be image bearers of God in the four spheres of relationship in which we were created. So let's, let's take a little quick look here at Genesis. If we go to the book of Genesis and we look at chapters 1 and 2, we find some interesting things about the way God created us at the very beginning. This was his intent, wasn't it, in Genesis. It's good to go back and look at 1 and 2 because this is what was on God's heart for us when he created us. Well, what do we find? Well, first of all, God created us for relationship with him. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening. Isn't that a great statement? They just hung out. They just hung out together. Could you imagine saying, well, honey, what do you want to do tonight? Let's just go walk around and hang out with God tonight. We get to do that someday, don't we, for the rest of eternity? And that's our future, right? It's to hang out with God. That's what heaven is, just hanging out with God. But they got to do this in real, in person. That was that intimacy in the relationship that they had. That's what God wants for all of us, is we just have intimacy and hang out with him. I just think that's the coolest thing. I don't know. Secondly, they had a clear relationship with himself. Adam and Eve knew who they were, why they were created, what their purpose was in life, and where they were going. Absolute certainty. They didn't have to go to a conference to find themselves, to discover what the purpose of life is. They knew the purpose of life because they hung out with him every day in the garden. That absolute certainty of, of their self-image and their understanding of who they were. Do you see that? Understand it? There's no, no question there. They had a good relationship with who they were and how God created them. The third is that they had a relationship with their neighbor. God created us to love our neighbor. Adam loved Eve. Eve loved Adam. Um, we were supposed to be in this wonderful relationship with one another. And finally, they had a perfect relationship with creation. And we see that spelled out beautifully in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. This relationship where God takes, and you know the very first words God ever said to humanity? The very first words that ever came out of the mouth of God to his new created humanity was, go to work. Go to work. First thing he ever said, took Adam, put him in the garden and said, take care of it. I created this for you. And now together, we're just going to take care of the garden. Obviously, he created the garden in such a way that it required Adam to do some work. You know, it wasn't all finished. It wasn't all perfect. Or otherwise, he would have just said, well, just walk around in the garden and enjoy it. But he didn't. He said, work it. There's work to do, Adam. I created you. Now, to be a creative person like me, get in the garden and let's take care of this thing, this beautiful thing that I gave to you. It's wonderful, isn't it? That's why our, we need a good theology of work. Because work is what God created us to do. It's the first thing he told him. So this beautiful sense of created with, or, or the relationship with creation around us. And I believe what this paints for us is a picture of a faithful steward. I mean, um, in this scenario, by the time you get done with Genesis chapter 2, how much of what God created did he give to Adam and Eve to own themselves? Well, none of it, right? None of it. He didn't say, okay, this is now yours, you own this, this is no longer mine, you can do whatever you want with it. No. He says, it's all mine. I created it for you. Now take care of it. Be a steward of your relationship with me, of your relationship with yourself, through your understanding. Be a steward of your relationship with one another and steward this beautiful creation. It's a picture of God's intent that our whole lives be lives of faithful stewardship. Do you see that? Don't miss that. If, if I've lost anybody, raise your hand. We'll go back and start over again. We okay? That's the purpose of life. That's what I see in Genesis 1 and 2. Beautiful setup for us to be stewards of all things. Well, then what did Christ do for us? And this, as I know, can be a fairly complicated looking diagram, so don't 
don't uh, go running out of the room here. But let me lead you through this a little bit. Because to me, this is, this is a, the kind of the critical point. So what this shows is on the left, this is what we've just got done talking about. Is that in the Garden of Eden, we had this fullness in all four areas of our created reality. That, that's what God's intent was. But in the fall, which we're going to talk about after the break, brokenness came and sin came into our lives and my belief from reading Genesis chapter 3 is that that sin brought brokenness at every single level of relationship in which God created wholeness. Is that right? Well, that would have been a good place for an amen. Amen? There you go. So our relationship with God was broken. Obviously, Adam and Eve, what, the first thing they did, they ran and they hid, right? They ran and hid. They couldn't even be in God's presence because sin brought brokenness. With themselves, I can imagine what it must have been like outside of the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve for the first time in their existence to realize that their purpose, their purpose in life was gone. And they were called to have fellowship with God. That was broken. They were to have fellowship with one another. That was broken. And to tend the garden. And they were kicked out of the garden. What's my purpose in life? Why am I here? What does God want from me? All those issues come up through sin. Certainly there was brokenness with our neighbor, right? First thing Eve does is, blame, no, Adam does is blames Eve. The woman that you gave me, all of us men, that's just one we've got we've to we've um, own, that, uh, that's what Adam actually said. The woman that you gave me caused me to sin. So there was brokenness between Adam and Eve, and certainly there was brokenness with creation. Um, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. They can no longer come into this beautiful place. And Adam is told that from this point on, you are going to earn your food from the weeds and the dust of the ground, the sweat of your brow, right? Brokenness. So if there's brokenness at all four levels, then what happened in the cross of Christ? What was, what was redeemed in Christ's work for us? Well, this is what I believe is a biblical, fully holy evangelical understanding of the redemption of Jesus Christ in our lives. For my friends, at every place that sin brought brokenness, Christ took that and redeemed it and gave it back to us. Is that not right? Yeah. Everything. As in, um, as in Adam, all men died, even so in Christ have all been made alive. Everything that was submitted and broken through sin was taken up and redeemed and given back to us in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, I've been raised in the church all my life. I consider myself fairly conservative evangelical. But I was never told this. I was never told this in seminary. I never learned this in Bible class, this holistic understanding of what Christ did. I was always told that the first one is really where it's all at. We were brought near by the blood of Christ. We were reconciled to God in the blood of Jesus Christ. And amen to that. That's hugely important. But that's only part of the story. Because sin didn't just destroy our relationship with God, did it? It destroyed all these others. So I want us to consider today what it means that our, that our understanding of who we are in Christ was taken up and redeemed and restored and is now given back to us. Well, let me put it a different way. As you sit here this morning, do you believe with your whole heart that you know with certainty why you were created what your purpose is, what your calling is, and where you're going. Do you know those things? Yes? Is that yes? That's, that's incredible in this world. It's just incredible in this world that you can say that in this brokenness in this world. But that's what Jesus bought back for us, was the certainty of understanding who we are, that we are children of God. We are redeemed in Jesus Christ. And that will be our identity regardless of what happens to us from the time we accept him until the time he takes us to glory. Amen? Amen. That was healed. Certainly our relationship with one another was, was healed. Um, and our relationship with creation was healed. We were restored to our call to be caretakers of God's creation. To, to take care of and steward everything now that belonged to him. So here's the important point. If this is true, if this is what was broken, and all of this was redeemed in Christ, then as we now are called back to be what we lost in the fall, but now we were this godly steward in Jesus Christ, everything, my friends, everything is given to us 
as a gift. It's a gift. Our lives are gifts. Our relationship with God is a gift. We lost it in the fall. It cost, us the, cost the blood of his son for God to purchase that back for us and to give it back to us now. And he says, be a steward. Take care of it. Our understanding of ourselves, our image, our identity is a gift. Our relationship with one another are gifts. I know sometimes there's people in your lives you can't quite believe are a gift. Yeah, amen. But they are, aren't they? And our relationship with the created world around us, which includes the way we look at our time, our money, our environment, everything else, it's all a gift. And so that brings us to this, this point that if, if, if all of it is a gift, then God comes to us and he says, take care of this. You are a steward of everything in your life. Take care of it. That's what I think Christ did for us, is he gave it all back to us, redeemed it, restored it, and gave it back to us for us to be stewards. Well, therefore, how are we to live? Let me go back to this for a second. How and where are we to live, to finish this section up? Let me just read this to you. As God's people, we are created to reflect the image of our Creator God through whole redeemed relationships in all four of these spheres, bringing glory to God, and practicing in each the ongoing work of the faithful steward. Uh, to me, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Set free to steward relationships in all four areas to the glory of God and bearing witness to them in this broken world. With God, with ourself, with our neighbor, and with creation. As godly stewards, therefore, and now I'm going to use this term, we seek to become one kingdom people. Well, what is a one kingdom person? Let me ask you this. In the Garden of Eden, how many kingdoms were present? There you go. And how many kings? How many lords? One. How many owners? One. And Adam and Eve were called to be one kingdom people because it all belonged to God. It was all His. Now, after the fall, and after the cross, and after the resurrection, and as we look forward to the second coming of Christ, he once again calls us to be one kingdom people, where everything in our lives is surrendered to him, where we don't play the owner, we don't hold on, but we give it all back to him. That's that visual picture of a one kingdom person. That makes sense? If you ask, well, what's the alternative of being a one kingdom person? Come back after the break. A little commercial there. So, this is the picture, I believe, of what God calls us to, really. Is in the end, this is all about full surrender. In the end, it's about saying, Lord, it's all yours. You gave it back to me as a gift, and I'm going to steward it. I'm going to have one Lord in my life, one owner, and I just seek to be faithful. I'm going to end up just with this one little illustration, and then we'll take a break for the coffee. Um, when I talk with leaders, I encourage them, as I will encourage you, to... I like icons. I don't know about you. I like, I like visual symbols of things that remind me, that bring to, to my mind some important biblical truth. So if you came to my office in Spokane, Washington, you would find next to my computer and some books and things on the, on the windowsill right to the left, you will find a jar of dirt. Just a jar of dirt. Big old pickle jar, about three quarters away filled with dirt. Why do I have a jar of dirt? Well, it reminds me every time I look at it of a very important truth that goes like this. Dirt is where I started. It's where I began, right? What does it say in Genesis chapter 2? And God formed man from the dirt, dust of the ground. I have friends that like to do genealogies. They like to trace their ancestors. And I tell them, you know, if you go back far enough, you get to dirt. <laughs> That's where it all started. That's the top of your chain when you get there. It's, it's, a, it's dirt. So dirt is where I started. And then Scripture also tells us that dirt is where I'm going to end up. Right? In the end, the worms win. They're going to turn us back to dirt. 
So here's the point. Between the dirt that was here at my beginning and the dirt to which I will return, everything in between, it's all God's. It's all God's. So I can sit in my office and feel stress and fear and anxiety welling up inside of me, and I'll stop and look at that jar of dirt and I'll go, Scott, why? What, what are you worrying about? This is God's. It's not yours. Give it up. Surrender it. It's a dirt to dirt type of thing. If that's a, at all a blessing to you, get a jar of dirt. And I really mean it. I was actually going to start marketing them. I was going to make all kinds of jars of dirt, <laughs> selling them all over the world, you know, for people to have. It's a very inexpensive reminder of a very important truth. It's all his, from friends. It's all his. And that is a statement of absolute joy, of absolute freedom. So back to our definition. A faithful steward is a follower of Jesus Christ who's been set free to live as a one kingdom person in every area of life. Does that a little more sense now? You see what that looks like? Because it's all his. To God be the glory. And that is the first chain that falls, is knowing that freedom. And this is my final word. When you can look this world in the eye and all of the temptations to play an owner, and you can say, I will not play the owner of anything in my life, but acknowledge that everything belongs to God, you will take off a chain and let it fall. And know a sense of freedom in your ministry and in your life. And with that, let's have coffee.